marketing, finance, HR and procurement in the global maritime as well as business service industry. Procurement Perch, one of the verticals of GACS, creates an ideal platform to share ideas, knowledge and experiences amongst the budding professionals in the corporate services. I would like to invite uh -huh. to me, one of the co-founders of Procurement Perch at GACS, an executive director at EFS, to give a brief about Procurement Perch. Aval, to you. Thank you so much, Alpa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Roundtable with uh, Procurement Perch. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce to all of you what Procurement Perch is all about. Uh, firstly, starting with the word itself. So most of you would be aware what Perch means. Now, Perch is an object on high ground to alight or roost temporarily to regain strength and clarity of vision. And we would have heard about birds perching. Now to perch somewhere means to be on top of or edge of something. And if you perch on something, you actually sit down very lightly on the very edge or the tip of it, ready to take off to the next level. The philosophy therefore behind procurement perch was for the procurement uh, professionals to kind of regroup uh, stay put, regain their strength, and in this new world post the Corona virus, take on the new world challenges and take off to the next level. Now, the whole philosophy of procurement perch has been taken by the concept of the golden circle, which is promoted by the thought leader, thinker, philosopher, Simon Sinek, which talks about why, how, and what. Why do we do what we do? How do we do what we do? And what do we actually do? So the vision was very clearly set out through building a one-of-a-kind leading community of strategic procurement professionals connected to serve a common goal of knowledge sharing, engagement, energizing, and creating excitement. Now, how are we going to do all of this? So we said we will establish certain key pillars within Procurement Perch. The first one is through videos. And these videos are going to be focused on procurement and business. And they're going to be videos of leaders who will share their thoughts, share their leadership philosophy. We will talk about digital transformation. We will bring in thoughts on innovation and creativity and talk about some of the new and upcoming trends that we see in different industries. The second pillar we said we will establish through talk shows, which will be chats with industry leaders. The chats are going to be very informal. It is going to be focused at the individual and will talk about their own career journey and is going to bust some myths and challenges that we hear almost on a daily basis. The third aspect will be around e-learning and we will try and establish a procurement center of excellence. There will be e-learning modules that will be set up. And these modules are going to cover around procurement fundamentals and fundamentals not as we knew in the traditional procurement parlance, but the fundamentals as we move forward in the new digital era. We're going to talk about the supplier management. We're going to talk about negotiations in the new digital world. We're going to talk about how do we manage risk and all of this is going to be focused on core procurement knowledge, upgrading of skills of our procurement professionals. There are also going to be a lot of white papers that will be published. And then the fourth pillar, the very, very key and fundamental is what and why we are today here is around the monthly roundtable forums. Now the monthly roundtable forums are going to be very, very focused and will cover specific trending topics. It will be about knowledge sharing. It, it will be about lessons learned. It will be about interaction between participants. It is also talking and bringing out aspects of the individual professional's journey in terms of crisis, how they've managed some of the things that they've managed within their organization, some of the best practices they've imbibed and so on. 
we are also going to have a very very focused membership drive trying to build an exclusive procurement community the whole membership is going to be industry agnostic we are going to map industries and organizations and the professionals within those industries and organizations and bring as many people on board as it is possible we are going to focus on communication so you will as we move forward going to see a lot of news media coverage communication through newsletters digital platforms and it's going to be focused on what's changing with the procurement professional awards and recognition some of the promotions that these professionals get within their organizations but is only limited to their own organization we are going to promote them across industry across the social media channels and platforms so that essentially is what procurement perch is all about and what we are trying to achieve thank you all very much for your patient hearing over back to you alba thank you aval for giving us the essence of procurement perch in that and we would recommend procurement professionals to register themselves on the procurement perch website the idea of the round table as aval mentioned is to invite distinguished experienced professionals to talk about their professional and personal experiences through crises and give their opinions on specific topics which would bring about awareness and knowledge to the audiences we shall have the interactive question and answers at the end of the session as we come out of this lockdown in different parts of the world in today's round table we will be discussing about the reimagining and exploring procurement 2021 we have with us long time veterans with a great experience in procurement and supply chain amit verma and vivek pratap singh amit is a seasoned global sourcing executive with an experience of over two decades in fortune 500 companies in global shared services IT and BPO leading strategic sourcing procurement consulting and supply chain at CBRE South Asia one of the largest commercial real estate in the world he is a strong believer in creating robust stakeholder partnership that is paramount for making business successful and is a passionate negotiator he enjoys inspiring and developing people to become exceptional professionals besides good human being he is a cpsm scmp pmp amp green belt certified he is not only academically and professionally affluent but is a marathon runner yoga practitioner and enjoys reading indian mythology with such a diverse portfolio i invite you to be one of our speakers at the round table thank I'm you so also, much alpa yeah <laughs> i'm also pleased to invite vivek pratap singh senior vice president and head of procurement at kpmg india he is focused on procurement supply chain contribution to successful outcomes that align with company strategy through partnering strategic initiatives and technology enabled execution he has honed his skills in stakeholder and team management global local sourcing supply chain procurement systems and transformation and vendor and partner management an imi graduate with cips and leadership and management at insiad he enjoys running keeping up with cricket and soccer vivek hi good morning everyone and thank you so much for the kind introduction alpha good okay. to be on the call thank you gentlemen for for your precious time both your knowledge and novel experiences shall have great weightage in today's round table as you all know the covid 19 pandemic has put an enormous strain on the global supply chains at times halting manufacturing while shutting down airports and seaports interrupting delivery of raw materials and finished goods but for the procurement to lead the way companies want to reimagine not just what the function does but also how it operates and which new capabilities it will need 
At the onset of the pandemic, some of the most drastic value pool shifts occurred in the commercial real estate and oil gas, which were among the sectors most affected. And today we have with her us Vivek from oil and gas and Amit from real estate. How best can we have both the professionals to talk about how they addressed and reimagined the procurement in their companies? So to start with Amit, I would like to ask you as to how did you address to 2020 and rethink the category strategies to strengthen supply chain resilience in 2021? Okay, great. So first of all, thank you so much Alpa for the, for the wonderful introduction and good to see the variety uh, spread of the procurement folks on the call. So, and I'm sure, you know, I'm gonna share uh, some of my thoughts. And the, the overall objective is that it's, it's to have a mutual learning and not only one way. And I am a strong believer to be a student throughout the life. I think that that's where you get the maximum learning, maximum agility to being the best. And at the same time, you are hungry for, for, for getting something new. So with this, let me share my opinion and thoughts. As I mentioned about agility, I think this is the one word which is the core to, to anyone's in be it professional life or a personal life. So 2020, of course, you know, no doubt it was uh, an year wherein uh, with, with the, I think maybe one of its kind in last one uh, century to experience the, the, the severe pandemic. And that taught us to be agile once again. Okay, so, and when I say it's to be, uh, it's like more of a reinforcement. So when we see the agility, it actually was a testimony of, uh, of how better you performed in those tough situations, okay? So like, you know, we manage over 500 clients in India and, uh, and managing them with the current, with the situation that uh, the supply chain was the most disruptive situation at that point of time. And organizations which survived or sailed through with this was the most agile organization. So we were able to uh, support organization with the, with the need uh, that they were looking at, be it the, the sanitizer, be it their back to office strategy. So I think that was very, very important. If I look at the 2021 on the broader category, <clears throat> so, the, the time has come to relook at the bottom of costing. So how you are looking at your overall pricing vis-a-vis -vis the strategy that you had earlier, I think that's gonna make a very, very big difference. What new things that you can bring in uh, from the ideas like uh, if be it the, the OEM strategy, which is more like a monopolistic situation, or be it looking at the new ways of operating your business. So, so uh, the time was when most of the uh, providers were sitting on, say, for example, a cost plus contract. So it's 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 like you know coming back to the table once again to see, do we really want to go with this? Do we want to look at the core versus the non-core? I think that's one of the lesson which we have learned and we in turn are, are you know, discussing with the client that guys, if we can focus on the core vis-a-vis -vis non core, that's gonna yield a very, very uh, fruitful result. So, so that's pretty much uh, as of now uh, from, from my side. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, very, very good points that you have given and uh, definitely companies have come up with uh, stating as to what is important into their purchases, what is core, what is non-core, and that's very well picked up by yourself and your organization. Let us hear from Vivek as well as to how their company worked on to in 2021. Okay, um, so you know, first of all, I, I do see uh, quite a few familiar people. Uh, good to see Aval. He's been doing a lot of, uh, you know, getting trying to get people together from the supply chain community for a bit. Aval, good to be with you. I see John and uh, earlier Anju and some of you. So that's tough. Um, see, first of all, yes, it was a crisis. 
but I will say it was not the first crisis I ran into. Okay, uh, so those of us who have been around for a little bit, um, you know, in the in the 90s, if you remember, there used to be an HIV crisis, and at that time I used to be in Africa. There were the Gulf Wars. Um, then later there was the SARS virus, if people remember, and memory goes that far. Um, there was 9-11 incident in America when uh, it looked every the whole world would come down. And then there was the global financial crisis in 2008 and where all the CAPEX projects were pretty much looking to a shutdown. And then this big one came. Um, and of course, I think this one takes the cake by far. You know, at no organization, and I, and I don't speak uh, specifically for my company, but more generally in terms of the services industry, um, never have people been so impacted by something um, to this extent. You know, in, in all the other ones that happened, um, you could see a trend. Like when the global financial crisis happened, it was like a lot of people in the financial services losing jobs. But Manufacturing was on in China, in India, in lots of places. The manufacturing process was on. So you could live through that. In this one, uh, I'll tell you honestly, when the shutdown happened, when people could not come to the office, when people could not move, I think that's when reality hit in that, guys, this is totally, totally different. And um, I think uh, while it was scary, um, let us never miss the point that the vendor partnership, and this is a highly underestimated aspect, and, and this is one area that I want all of us procurement people, and it's my request actually, that we need to kind of step forward because all our services, if not all, all but most of our services are provided by the vendor partner community. Okay? And I will say with confidence that if not for this partner community, uh, most companies could not have sailed through. All your telecom service providers, I think they were like brilliant. Brilliant means um, it took a few days, but I, I believe all the organizations were able to work something out, right? So we spent a lot of time speaking to some of these partners in, hey guys, we have a problem. How will you do it? And they were a pretty calming effect that do not worry, we got it under control. We said, do you have a BCP? He said, of course we have a BCP. Um, you have some of the equipment service providers. And it, you know, one of the learnings in this whole thing was that uh, planning helps and the good organizations, honestly, they really stood out. Whether these people were doing simple things like provided transport Simple things like, you know, maintaining UPSs in the office and something. When something goes down, um, you don't know what to do. But these guys, you know, whatever way they had, but they were all standing right behind us. So I think it's very important that we acknowledge the role of the vendor and partner community and kind of promote the work they do within our organizations and within our, you know, larger fraternity to particularly pick out the good cases. Um, did we come on under any, you know, other stuff apart from the ones which Amit said? No, we were doing very much the same thing, you know, of the core and non-core. But the important part is that the vendor community kind of stepped up and was able to help us in a lot of areas, a lot of areas. Okay, so back to you, Alka. Oh, great, uh, Vivek. That's a good thing to acknowledge the vendor partnership, and that is what uh, is the prime or the key that we first learn in procurement. So that was very well said. So besides agility, as we all know, uh, partnership also plays an important role in bringing about uh, or strengthening the supply chain resilience in 2021. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Amit, to you. Uh, business continuity planning has taken a new meaning. How did you and your company design the contingencies? Okay, so I think another great question, Alpha. And uh, uh, there is a term um, that uh, uh, that is very much popular in our in our sourcing world called Batna and Watna. Okay, so so uh, and and this is something which is my favorite. So Batna is nothing but uh, 
um, you know, maybe for the people uh, who might be hearing it for the first time, but it's something which I really like to share. So BATNA is like the best, best alternative to negotiate an agreement. Whereas VATNA is the worst uh, situation to negotiate an agreement. So it's like best to worst. So, and I couldn't agree more with Vivek when he spoke about the partnership with the supplier. And this something, you know, which I never call my vendor as a vendor. They are our partner. They are our backbone. It's not that we, it's not that only they need us. No, we, we need each other. It's a partnership and, uh, you know, being with the industry for over like uh, two and a half decade, I was always on the client side throughout in the, in the varied industries. And now being on the other side of the table, I can see a very different world, you know, that the kind of terms that we use, the kind of, uh, you know, treatment at times you get. So, I think this is something which is very, very important when we look at the vendor, not as a vendor, but as a partner. So now coming back to the Bartna and Watna strategy. So, so this actually helps you in building the alternative, in building your BCP and what best, you know. So it was again, so to test that how better are we prepared, how seamless was our supply chain or how seamless were our business operations were tested during this tough time, okay? I see rather this as an opportunity uh, in this pandemic that what can we improve? What innovation can we bring to the table? You know, stuff like we got the, 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 the digital catalog. We, we brought like various playbooks in place wherein you are now not dependent on coming to office, at the same time, those things are available at the click of a button. The other things, how well have you enabled your employees? So there are, I mean, we've got multiple examples in the industry, wherein India was something which was treated as people will not deliver efficiency if they work from home. Now, after almost uh, a year of this pandemic, I think we have we have learned, and most more or less the Indian leaders have accepted that yes, Indians can deliver more efficiently. Let me quote unquote, not efficiently, but rather more efficiently if they work from home. I totally and, agree with you. Right. So this is a great, great mindset shift which has happened. And and what next? You know, so we started with the BCP that we got to see that how we are able to manage our operation. And now we are actually at a leapfrog situation where we're saying, let's take it to the next level. Okay, which is innovation uh, and whatever, you know, steps you take, it's not 100% guaranteed that they all will succeed. There is a room for failure. And I think organizations which have this capability, this I would say legacy will survive much, much faster and longer versus the other side of, uh, of industries. So, so I think uh, uh, besides this digital library, uh, from a supply chain perspective, uh, we were actually able to deliver the IT and real estate hardware to employees home to enable them and make work. And of course, there was a lot of partnership within the organization, which was important. And though, you know, we, we, we speak about these words, partnership, agile, but I think the time was the testimony that how well you were coordinated, how well were you partnering? And, uh, you know, uh, I will not name the, the organization because of the confidentiality, but we actually delivered over 100,000 IT hardware to employees' houses to make sure that the business operation is up and running. And this is despite the fact that company had a very stringent IT policies that they will not allow any employee to use office technology from home. So companies were agile to give those enable things, 
to at least put those firewall or whatever the, the different IT uh, uh, governance thing, but they were able to manage. I can give an example of Cisco, you know, because this is a public uh, information. During this pandemic, Cisco actually experienced 40 times more webinar uh, on, their, on their WebEx platform. And within 22 days, the Cisco's global IT team were able to manage this situation under control. You know, imagine from 1x to 40x. And I think that's a great, great example which we can pick from the industry. Quite commendable, yes. So uh, uh, over to you, Alpa. You know, I've got multiple examples. So, but you know, yeah, in the spirit of time, you you know, know in... that this will give about more knowledge and knowledge sharing to our other budding professionals. You know, who are keen to learn as to how best values that you could give or with examples. So please uh, feel free to go ahead with that, Amit. If you could give one or two more examples about this business continuity, it would be a great help to the budding professionals. Okay, wonderful. So let me give another example wherein uh, we had a situation of stuck employees uh, uh, from the travel perspective. So the organization did not had a, a technology platform to track that where are those where are their employees worldwide yeah. and, and again it's it's a global multinational i cannot share the name so so imagine the situation uh, in, a, in a global organization wherein hundreds of uh, employees are traveling across the globe and be, because of this sudden shutdown you don't know where are those employees. I mean, you, you have a travel desk, et cetera, et cetera, but you don't have a unified platform. So in that situation, we actually helped that organization uh, to build a platform uh, and make sure that, uh, that again, not 100%, but over 70% were able to track the whereabout of, the, of those employees. And this, this has happened because of this strong network that we have placed across the globe. And of course, uh, it was not possible without the support of our vendor partner. Again, you know, coming back from Vivek's point of the partnership, the yeah. supplier, you know, without them, we cannot succeed. And, you know, uh, I actually conducted uh, a, a, a supplier partner reward and recognition program in my earlier organization, uh, which was MetLife uh, Global Operations. And I, I actually got one of the feedback. This is that MetLife is using their supplier as a partner. At least we have been treated humanly. And that's something really, you know, touched my heart. This is, you know, there are organizations wherein we are not even treated the, with the right humanity. It says, oh, it's a vendor, let him wait for one hour, two hour, three hours. I don't think, you know, so a lot has shifted in the industry. I think there is a need to do more in this. That's true. I totally agree with you, but that's very good keep key takeaways that you have provided to us, especially about your partner and partner, which is true, true in today's life. Yes, and uh, partnership with vendors and suppliers and giving them the recognition is also very commendable. And I truly agree with the way um, the procurement or all the companies took forth in uh, ensuring that they in India as well, people, the mental block of, you know, visiting the offices every day from this time to this time or work for more hours, uh, the productivity will be better, but then work from home to switch it completely to that new era. Uh, they have taken it very, very well and positively, which, um, uh, hats off to most of the companies and their procurement organizing the, the IT equipments to everything as you did mention, Ahmed. That's really very commendable. Thank you. Vivek, may you uh, let us know as to how you brought about with this business continuity in your organization? 
Yeah, so I, um, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just take forward from what Amit said and, and a few other points. Um, let me just uh, pivot to the employee side of things, okay? The side about enabling the organization, getting people at home, the ability to start working. And there was a huge logistics exercise. And obviously procurement's not the only one. There's the operations team, there's IT team. But the ability to work together and get these things done is important. The ability to channelize your vendor partners to support you because we are not going to go get the stuff there. It's these people who are enabling us. But just on the on the employee side, you know, um, most organizations would have set up a crisis management team um, and the directions were pretty much uh, from the crisis management team. But I'll tell you one of the good successes in this thing. Uh, it's a common problem that comes up on all our forums and here we have to all partner slightly better. And I mean a point like this, that when this incident happened, you might remember that there were some people getting cases, if not the employee, maybe a family member or somebody. And you would also realize that it was hard to get into a hospital, right? It was hard to get a doctor appointment. It was hard to get to know what to do, how to do. So there was a lot of problems in that area. And I think here, uh, some crisis management teams did a great job. And on our side, I think it was to find some sources, not directly, but through, you know, the conversations. We found a good organization that provided online consultation. So I'm not saying now where it's the norm. I'm saying at that time where you couldn't reach a doctor because doctors weren't coming and so on. So a good organization where you could get teleconsultation. But I think something more important than that, even to get a COVID test, you could not get it unless you have a doctor consultation or something like that. So you could get a prescription, you could get a consultation, you could get a prescription. On the basis of prescription, you could go get a test. And on the basis of the test, then you could go do something. So I think uh, enabling that for tens of thousands of employees and many multiple of the number of family members, I think that was a very, very good part, which... Uh, I am aware, I'm sure a lot of organizations would have also done that. And at a very, very good price point, you know? And when I say price point, I'm saying per employee, it would not even cost 15, 20 rupees per month. So, um, you know, I, I think that was one of the very good outcomes that came in this crisis, which was not easy. So hence, you know, we need to leverage our network to find organizations that support these kind of things. The other part is insurance. If you got into hospital, you need the support for the whole system because you could not withdraw enough cash. You could not get to ATMs. You, somebody not accepting, you know, your checks and so on. But I think that very important player, the insurance company, they really did a fabulous job of not causing any trouble throughout. And while, you know, it was a huge exposure on the side, they, they kind of really enabled things. So, you know, these are a couple of examples where, you know, not just the vendor partner on the external side enabling all of us, say in telecoms, in transport, um, in a lot of other similar activities, but also on the inside of enabling us not to be afraid, you know, that there is a solution, there's a way we can do it. And I think organizations and crisis management give very, very good directions to help us get some of these things going. And nice thing, it didn't cost that much money, right? But not having it would have caused a huge problem to people in terms of how to handle the situation in case some unfortunate thing happened. So back to you, Alpa. That's a very good uh, point with regards to the employees because for companies, it's a people company that that makes it more prosperous. So, you know, and uh, who else, but uh, Amit would know better having worked with MetLife earlier, uh, that how insurance companies really take a stand during this crisis period and assist uh, the employees or uh, how best uh, the crisis management team and even uh, the crisis management team would get in, um, 
uh, and take the support of the procurement as well during this period of time in order to facilitate or to provide the best that can be provided to all the employees, which I truly agree that uh, for a company, the people or the employees are also very important. Thank you. So we go ahead with just, this. Alpha, you let, all let have add, Sorry. Yeah, let, let me add something to this, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, employees, they are the asset of organization. Yes. You know, uh, I heard, it, it actually reminds me of a quote from Narayan Murthy. He was standing at his campus first floor and he was looking downstairs at six o'clock in the evening. And uh, the, it was actually a shift over time. So employees were going back. And then uh, someone asked him that, uh, what are you seeing? He said, I, I'm just seeing my assets going. And that person did not realize or did not understand the point that, what is he saying? He said, they all are my asset. So they are going. And now, you know, after some time, I will regain my asset. And, you know, though at the face of it, it was like a very normal statement. But if you deep dive into it, it's a very, very powerful statement. You know, yeah. if we treat employee as, a, as an asset, I think, uh, uh, the, I mean, it, it cannot be better than that. Because if you, if, you know, and we also say that if, if, even if you're working in an organization and most of us would, would uh, resonate with it, that people do not leave the company, they leave the manager. So yeah. eventually it is boiling down to the people Companies for a name say, I mean, they create their goodwill, they create their brand value because of the people. You know, in CBRE, we have, we have taken care of our employees like anything, not only in India, but worldwide. Okay, so there are so many digital platforms from the health and wellness perspective, which got created and those services were given to all the employees worldwide use this, this technology, be it an online yoga or an aerobics or a doctor, you know, so many things that got, uh, that got uh, disseminated to employee to make sure that employee get attuned to this change, you know, and it's not only, you know, uh, I'll give you an example like in Canada, yeah. though it, work from home is a very common practice there, but even there, people were actually saying that, no, it's getting really monotonous because at least once a week, they were going to office and that was a time for them to see change. But now with this complete lockdown, they were not able to step down. Uh, they, not, they were not able to step down. And at the same time, the work pressure was almost two or three X versus what we used to do earlier. So at that point of time, things like this, when you take care of your employee by these digital means, it means a lot. And that speaks a lot about the organization legacy and their, their, their strength. I truly agree with you, Ahmed, because and hats off, I'm also, uh, I, I like the Aaron Murthy to the extent that, you know, whatever he says, it, it gives about so much of strength uh, for any organization to think about, or even uh, you talk about JRD Tata, to name a few, uh, even Udamurti for that matter, which brings so much of positivity in an employee that you know you want to do something for the organization. And uh, yes, I do agree. Uh, with, uh, we were in Dubai and uh, we can uh, really imagine uh, the, with the lockdown and everything, we were also a bit suffocated with additional tasks and work and pressure. But uh, to manage the, uh, the procurement globally was also quite a lot of challenge. But uh, with a good business continuity strategic plan, which and of course the digitalization, etc., it brought about a lot of improvement, and uh, I think it just geared up in a very positive and a true way. So that really helped. Thank you so much, Amit, for your insight.
And audiences, if you have any questions, please do uh, send out so we could discuss that later on with our uh, veterans here. Um, but to carry on and go ahead, procurement leaders will want to take a different approach uh, de-risking their supply chain to make it less vulnerable to disruption. In addition to recovering profitability, finding ways to preserve the cash, companies face the added challenges of shifting the dynamics, changing ways of working, increasing volatile demand. So restructuring of contracts to minimize the risk exposure must have been one of your agenda. How did you go about, uh, Vivek? Okay, so I think, uh, you know, I'll speak in the context of services industry. And in the oil industry, it was very different. In the oil industry, you know, the bill rates are so high, equipment sitting there. And um, so when we had that kind of crisis around 2014, uh, the approach was very different. It was just I try and shut down everything. And oil and gas contracts are slightly more complex. You know, they, they're not, um, I would say, as, as easy as the services industry. Here you can have a conversation. There the dollar is, uh, is so paramount, those are so, such large contracts that for any party to exit, there's typically some kind of a penalty. So, but in this context, I think it was not so much the restructuring of the contract. That was only required in a couple of instances. For example, in some IT services where you had a fixed price contract. Um, from moving from a fixed price contract, because the assumption was there are lots of people and they're all working in the offices and the whole model was built around that and priced around that. And now everybody's working from home and all the tools are remote support tools. Uh, the equipment seems to handle okay. So moving from a fixed price to a more time and material type of contract, uh, that's something you know uh, one could negotiate. There were some multi-year running contracts which it was not possible to, to renegotiate. So you know you had to take a very practical view to what can be done and what can't be done. However, the whole exercise um, had a slightly different dimension in my view. But rather than just squeezing and fighting on cost and everything, I think the focus on deferring, deferring cash was more important, okay? Because there were kind of two problems. The first problem is you don't know whether you'll be able to move around and you could start normalizing things. First part. The second part was you don't know how long this is going to go, right? Is it going to go for two months? So initially we thought one lockdown, okay, at the end of April, we are all good. But when that didn't happen and you said another lockdown and things like that, everybody got jittery. Now, I think it was very important to conserve cash and a lot of the contract discussions were also around deferral of services. So if you're going to bill me April, May, June, I'm saying I'm not going to pay you for April, May, June. But if I have a three-year contract, I'm adding two or three months and you will get paid. So you may not get paid for this period. And I must say that, uh, you know, that kind of an approach was, was positive. Yes, some people, you know, uh, they also faced cash flow problems. But I would like to say that conserving cash, deferring the cash payout, that was more important than restructuring the contract. Okay. So Amit, over to you, please. Well, thanks, Vivek. And uh, actually, you know, I had uh, a similar thoughts, frankly speaking. Uh, uh, and to in extension to that, when we say, like, look at the deferring, the, the spend or limiting the cost, you know, we actually looked at that and that how best we can manage this situation with our partners, supplier partner. So imagine one way, we had a pressure from the client that since I'm not availing the services, I should not be paying. And at the same time, there was a contractual requirement which was, which was uh, forcing client to make that payment. 
That was the one side of the table. The other side of the table, wherein my supplier partner, they were saying, we are available for the business. We are available for the services. But if there is no requirement, that's not our fault. That's so right. both sides, there was a very creative tension, I would say, right? So, and that's where in the pendulum, we would kind of like conduit between both the sides to see how best we can manage the situation. So, uh, one option that could, which could have been uh, the the prevalent one that, you know, guys, if you don't do this, I'm going to terminate the contract because I'm not availing the service. I've got multiple providers in the industry. I can go to the option two or three. This is one side. The option, the other option could be that, you know, I know that there have not been any services. Okay, while there is a, a defined cost, which we call it maybe more from an from a fixed cost perspective, that it, it is incurred, while from the OPEX perspective, it is not there. So can we look at a mediocre path, may not be 100%, maybe an X percentage, which we can pass on to a client. And that actually build a better strength and partnership between the two and it helped sell both the parties. But having said so, there, there were clients uh, who were not willing to buzz. Well, that's absolutely okay with due respect because you know we are in the business. So uh, we did share that you know this is what can happen. Today, maybe the supplier partner is at the receiving side, but guess what? Tomorrow situation might change. And I have heard so many examples in India wherein uh, you know, uh, companies negotiated very hard with developers on the on their leases and because they were at the receiving end some really bleeded you know and, and at the same time there were organizations which Vivek, like you mentioned they actually took a very very strategic approach where they said let's look at the same extension uh, lease for another couple of months so that there is no impact to both the sides, okay? Because situation is gonna change, it will improve. I mean, uh, and history is, is, is there. So that's not the case, it's only the time which, which everyone need to uh, sail through. And that's how these situations really help and mitigate those situations. But I think uh, being the procurement and sourcing expert, it is very, very important and paramount for us to draw that balance. I use this word creative tension. I, and I learned a lot from this. It's important to have disconnects. It's important to have uh, so-called the difference of opinion, but it is very good till the time these are used in a constructive manner. They are used for the benefit rather than taking it to, to, the, to the personal side. And, and I think this is where we get a real, real learning and a change to grow and change to transform. I totally agree with you, Ahmed. But uh, would you have uh, worked on to various, uh, say suppose you worked on to the CAPEX and OPEX uh, adjustments, but uh, as Vivek mentioned, the tenure went on in pushing and increasing. So you might have thought, okay, it's a matter of only a few months, but it stretched to uh, a longer period and till date, I mean, there are a few companies that still work from home. They have certain uh, restrictions as well. Uh, a few of the uh, imports, exports, everything was affected. Would you have worked on to or reworked on to something more strategically, a bit different from besides the deferral of services or how did you work out to conserve the cash flow within the organization? Did you uh, benefit to the organization by restructuring or using some kind of a strategic uh, uh, policy or something which no one could have thought that it would come up? Okay, I can share a couple of examples and, uh, uh, and those are like real. Okay, so uh, in, <clears throat> in uh, one of the strategic approach we have taken wherein we stopped the increased renter, which was part of the lease, 
but you said that this increase will not be applicable. So that, you know, the term got extended. So while uh, there was a protection to both the parties, client as well as developer, and at the same time, the cash flow increase was also protected. There are situations wherein we, we actually help the client to resize their location strategy, wherein the, the entire uh, 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 layout of the area got changed. The another strategy we, we adopted that let's relook at the, the, the kind of workspace you have. Is it more hot desking? Is it more fixed or is it really agile? Okay, so then we looked at, we, we suggested some clients that, can you look at the different business units that do they really need the office space the way they are they are behaving today the way are, yeah, they are utilizing today and interestingly what in uh, in one of the client we actually found that there was almost 33% no from the different BUs that they can manage their work with 33% less space utilization so some smart organization they decided to stay within the existing within the premises but with a lower space and and have that and uh, agree arrangement with the developer some organizations they said no we would move to a rather a different place spend some time here till the time we built up the other area wherein they were getting further benefit on the leases because of the low cost uh, scenario there are certain organization who actually took the hybrid of both so, so there were multiple strategies that got in, that got uh, designed, and uh, and remember what one size doesn't fit all. So it's actually all designed to suit. Yes, but it is good that CBRE even thought of you know benefiting or going out and telling their uh, customers that okay or the clients that see this is how you could do the savings, which normally you know you wouldn't go straight forth and say, okay, here is how it, you could, or we could help you, you know, unless and until there is more pressure from the client's hand. But uh, that's a very positive strategy that uh, you use. This would bring about more loyalty from the clients to CBRE, yes. And, and you know, Alpa, uh, it's a very interesting term that you have used, uh, loyalty and, uh, and, and taking this step forward. So, we actually uh, applied this this uh, this strategy with our client that this is how you can reduce your cost. Yes. So rather client coming and asking us, we suggested that these are different ways that you can manage your cost, and there were multiple verticals. Okay, so and then we left this decision to the client that what is that they would like to prefer. From our perspective, they have the options. We can manage it. Okay, but eventually it's them who have to see within their work environment, within their guardrails, what is doable. Yes. So, and, and, and uh, you know, it really worked very, very well uh, for us. Oh, that's lovely. And Vivek, definitely with the volatility in uh, oil and gas, you would be having a lot of uh, uh, strategic policies keeping on changing and it would not as... Uh, Amit mentioned it would be only for a certain period of time or something of that kind. Yours must be minute by minute, I would uh, understand with the volatility that it took in. Yes, so again, you know, uh, Alpa, you're right. I, I left that industry a few years back, but okay. um, yes, the stakes are a lot higher. The stakes are higher. One thing also, which is very, very common in that industry, is a lot of the operations are remote. All the equipment has long lead times. And when you're talking of the rigs, when you're talking of the surface facilities in that industry, um, you know, you need very niche suppliers. And when you're dealing with niche suppliers, your ability to negotiate is very low. Your ability to recontract is very low. However, the positive side is two people know they have to work together. Okay, because once you've started a contract, the the ability, you know, just like the, the term Amit use, your ability to, to look at the next alternative is very, very low. So yeah. the only thing you can work out is kind of different, 
the reduction of scope. Um, if the market allows it, you can look at a reduction of man day rates. But yeah, equipment is a big thing. Equipment, you can typically get good reductions when the market is low. But again, to that point, which he said that you're not playing for that short period. Yes, yes, you. it's important that you address that. But you've got to be prepared that when the market rebounds, and history says it always does, that those people are working closely with you. So, so very peculiar industry, uh, very stakes are very high. I wouldn't like to be the top boss in that kind of a company, you know. <laughs> very yeah. tough. So Vivek, did your company think of investing in partnership and innovation to create competitive advantages? If not, how to how did you foresee and recommend would assist the post-COVID period? See, um, I no, so the the answer is that um, nothing specifically. Okay, our approach even before COVID was to work with few good companies. Uh, for the key items, for the rest of the items, it doesn't matter, or for the rest of the services, it doesn't matter. We can be very flexible. So I will take a pass on this one in the sense that, no, our strategy didn't change, but I must say that our relationships got a lot better because um, I, I'm a firm believer, and I, and I hope uh, other members on this call take this away. I firmly believe in executable contracts. Okay, and what I mean by any executable contracts are, you know, they're vendors whom you send them an RFP, you send them terms, conditions, then you fight with them on price, you get to any price when it comes to service, then they also nickel and dime you when time comes, right? And I'm saying that's not the spirit of what we're looking for. Yes, we're looking at the right price in the sense that the vendor also must be able to execute the contract to the standards your organization wants. Yes. And if your organization is a, you know, organization like a multinational or a company which is aspirational, growing, doing things fast, if your vendors are, and partners are not able to scale up, what's the point? So I think that quality of relationships during this part is good because now that we are resuming, everyone is there with us. You know, nobody is kind of saying, no, because they give very bad rates or because they don't pay attention to us, because they treat us badly, like Amit was saying, somebody, you, you know, people used to keep them waiting. It was a sign of your authority over somebody else. Just keep them waiting for an hour or two. We don't, you know, don't do that as a practice. And I think the quality of those relationships is now helping when things are coming back to normal to kind of not have to renegotiate and renegotiate that you brought our prices down, but now, you know, there's too much demand, please increase the prices. So, um, yeah, in a limited sense, yes, those partnerships are there. Yes, Vivek, I agree with you. The transparency with your vendors, it really uh, pays a lot in, during this time of crisis. What about you, Ahmed? You know, uh, so let me pick up the thread from uh, Vivek. So it's all about the uh, buyer market vis a vis a seller market. And, and the best is to be in between, okay? Otherwise, uh, it's not a win-win. It could be either be a win-lose or lose-win or a lose-lose, okay? So I'll give an example. I was attending a workshop uh, on negotiation wherein there was a case study given to us and said, this is the, this is, there were some broad facts given to us with number and uh, we were parted in team that you are a buyer and I'm a seller. They both, we both had our, our sort of uh, write-up. And this is now, let's see who is able to close this negotiation, which team is able to close the negotiation. So there were almost like uh, 23 teams, a uh, pair of two. And at the end, there was a zero team which was able to close that negotiation. Okay. So everyone said, no, it's a, both for buyer, the buyer said, no, no, I would be paying, uh, it's not a right price to me. For a seller, he says, I would not be making the profit. Then that prof actually taught us that these were the different heads that were given to you. And this was the money 
when I say money, was a profit which was lying on the table. And none of you, both from buyer and seller perspective, were willing to take. So you lost that opportunity. And very interestingly, that uh, workshop was designed for the teams to fail. Then Prof actually you know, told us, he said, if I design it for a, for a success, then you all will know, you know, what you're doing is already right. There is no scope for improvement. There is no scope for learning. And I think that was the time when I saw that every time that what is that lying on the table? And of course, it has to be executable, what Vivek mentioned. If we make it executable, believe you me, it will become win-win. Otherwise, whenever the situation comes, either for a buyer or a seller, there will be a cutting corner to it. I think this is, this is one. Number two, which is very, very important that with this situation, we have always been investing in the partner. We have a history wherein there are partners, supplier partners who started their journey with us, with CBRE. And today I'm proud to say that they have gone multi-million dollar organization only serving in India. They have got presence across India they have got employees base, which is more than like 30,000. And they started their journey with us and still they are associated with us. I personally myself have a history of a 92% vendor retention ratio. So, so vendor partner who started with us, they were retained till the time I was there. And I'm a firm believer that, that it pays in a long term. One should not be looking at any short-term strategy. Short-term, you might, you might win, but eventually you will lose. There is no second thought about it. Unless you are extremely, extremely different or lucky, that is different. But, but long-term, you, you have to be very, very clear. And another example here is, are you, you got, I mean, this is one question that we need to ask ourselves. Am I a marathon runner or am I a, or am I a Olympic runner? Okay. So Olympic, we run hundred meters or 200 meters and we win the gold. Okay. In marathon, full marathon is 42 kilometer. Okay. And then we win the gold. This 200 meters, is maybe you know you're 30 seconds or 25 seconds and you are you're there but in marathon it is like you know hour an hour and a 45 minutes that will help you reach there so while the output is same in both the cases the gold medal but look at the life what is the span of a of a marathon runner which is definitely long term Visive is the Olympic, which is very short term because your, your, your body starts to, to squeeze very fast. So I think we got to ask this question ourselves and see who am I? Where do I want to run? Is it a long term or is it a short term? And I think it answers a lot. So, you know, coming back, uh, and I'm sorry I'm giving these examples, just going with the flow. No, but, but it is really very, very good uh, and exciting to hear about uh, the practical examples as well that an individual might have come across. And who would know uh, the uh, statistics of a marathon runner and an Olympic, but you as well, uh, right. which is really very, very good at this age and time to be a marathon runner is not very easy, yes, but uh, uh, keep up the good work, uh, Amit. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Alpa. Uh, Over to you. Well, the last but not the least question, uh, adoption of uh, digitalization procurement to bring real business impact. What new technology did your company bring about Vivek? So, um, you know, I, I spent um, quite a few years in procurement automation. Um, okay, so I'll be brief. I'm cognizant of the time and, you know, I would like to make one or two points at the end. Um, I did not change anything on the automation. So 
on the digital side, you know, um, and when I use the term digital, I'm looking at a much more larger context. Automation procurement wise, yes, we, we had that. But a lot of the paper documents, which we were getting approvals and things like that, I think some of our team members did a great job and uh, we didn't have to start, you know, we stopped using paper documents, so, so which is okay. And I'm sure it's the same for most organizations. But one point I would like to make that a lot of organizations, you know, spend a lot of time putting in tools and these are really process tools. Process tools of taking a requisition right up to the P2P tools of up to payment or some extent of, you know, RFPs and ERFX in the middle and all. So there's a lot of process tools. I don't want everyone, at least in my terminology, not to call that digital. When I'm looking at digital, apart from the process tools, which are, you know, the backbone, if I could call them, I think we should also spend time on knowledge tools. So no, did we do it? No, we didn't do it. But the, the forward path is to integrate more with knowledge tools and tools which will enable buyers and contract management people to actually take decisions, to get some advanced information, to have a knowledgeable discussion about vendors. See, amongst ourselves as a community, uh, we cannot discuss price, right? We cannot discuss price because of confidentiality reasons. But it doesn't stop us to broadly or in some way start having meaningful conversations about you know, certain commodities, certain industries, certain vendors, their performance and things like that. So I, I'm more in line with, yes, we didn't adopt anything new apart from this recommendation of a award pool, which automated the whole flow. But digital, there's a longer journey to go. Over to you, back to you. Yes, Ahmed. Uh, uh, could you let us know about yourself? Your okay, so, uh, so when I say digital, uh, we have uh, a different vertical to when we look at digital. Digital as a services to our client in their soft services arena, wherein we have got a lot of new technologies uh, implemented. Uh, both from the automation and IoT perspective, be it the washroom or be it the office, be it the desk management. This other vertical is uh, sourcing. I will say that we have had a, a, a good technology backing, but what we have learned with the situation is to expand the horizon, how we can integrate it further so that we get more customized reports or information at the click of a button. Third, in this digital world, we actually went ahead and said that how this reach can be enhanced within the existing audience. So there was a lot of focus uh, placed on the usage of this digital thing. So while it's good to implement digital tools, but we got to see how effectively are they being used. I think that is something which is uh, which which we learned uh, not only with with my organization but even in the industry as a whole. One thing which I which I would like to connect with this is uh, the the tumble onward strategy. When I say tumble onward, what is this actually? You know, so it is actually you are giving. Uh, you're, you're empowering your team to take, uh, uh, to take an idea towards execution. And at the same time, you are giving the flexibility to fail, to accept the failure. Okay, so, uh, and it's okay, if, even if you have got like uh, five ideas and four got failed, I think it's all right but the one which got succeeded is actually where the real innovation comes. And you look at Apple is, is a live example. You look at Samsung, you know, uh, in, in one of the forum, uh, we were told, I, I mean, there was, there was a very healthy discussion. Again, a healthy constructive discussion, wherein someone was uh, sharing that, uh, that uh, a, a, an equal renowned brand from Korea is actually copying uh, the Apple product. 
and they are selling it at a much lesser price. But the other side is that, look at, despite being that situation, how successful are they? Another reason to this, if you look at 98%, and again, I repeat, 98% of this world is running on copycats. So there is a book by the name Copycat, you know, people can surf, uh, Google it and read it, wherein you would find the 98% of these ideas, which we so-called innovation, they are not innovation. They have been copycatted. Someone tried, they failed, they dropped it, but then another person came and said, let me capitalize on it. So I think this is where we really got to take a step back and see how best we can manage it. And this is where this, uh, this term, which I learned recently, tumble onward, play a very, very important role. Thank ah, you so much, Alpha. Thank you. That's a very, very good thought and uh, a very good guidance that uh, Vivek and Amit, both of you have given. I, I assume Amit has a meeting uh, at around, in about three minutes. If anyone is interested in asking a question, please uh, go ahead. And also last thing I would say is, you know, um, if we can see if people are comfortable, uh, even for a moment or two, just put a face to the name um, so that we know each other. We don't just, yes. uh, you know, the first time we meet is at an interview or at a forum or something like that. But as procurement professionals, uh, you know, if you're comfortable, that's fine. It would be good uh, to to know you. Okay, I can see Bupendra and um, some of you. So Amit, I know you got to go. Uh, some closing. Arti, good to have you. Samir, nice. Anju, long time. Happy, happy Dubai to you. Thank you, Vivek. Bye. Thank you, All Amit, right. for the session. Thank okay. you so much, Anju. And uh, I think no one has any questions at the moment. It would have been good that uh, uh, you could have asked our uh, guests. Uh, of it and shared, they would have loved to share that knowledge. I'm truly impressed at how you reimagined and explored procurement 2021. Procurement can drive an organization's uh, pandemic recovery efforts. Forward looking companies will go a step further and completely reimagine what the function looks like to enhance the value that it can deliver. Investing in a stronger future practices and capabilities will pay off in the short term and help organizations emerge stronger and better prepared for any future crisis. As they say, the winning procurement organizations will adopt a continuous learning culture as a way of life. So thank you very much, Amit and Vivek, for your precious time. Thank you. Um, the audiences for your time. Alpa, Alpa yes. I'm sorry to interject. Uh, so uh, I want to share one fact. And this is, uh, actually, I find that to be very, very interesting. And that's why, it's, since it's a, it's a public uh, domain information, so it's okay to share the detail. Okay. There's a survey run by McKinsey. Yeah. Okay. And the survey is run by them for with about, <clears throat> about uh, 125 CEOs having uh, a CEO of organization having over $1 billion revenue. And there are three facts in, the, in, the, in this procurement and sourcing world that they have given. And that's something really excited me. <clears throat> so number one, they said that almost 70% of the CEOs, CFOs and CIO, they believe that negotiation center of excellent, center of excellence will have a very high impact in the negotiation outcome. Imagine this thing is coming from the top leadership of these, uh, these top brands globally. The other fact they are saying that 93% <clears throat> of these CEOs and CFOs, they are actually looking at creating a new role, which is a chief negotiation officer and this role will be supported by the negotiation coach or a deal team and further supported by the line function or the procurement teams. So that's the new vertical which the industry is looking at. The third, 
which is very close to me and uh, i actually reserved this as a as a as a last uh, remark from me as a closing statement wherein they are saying that 80% of the ceos and cfo they believe that this sourcing has made almost a 3% ebitda impact on their company performance which is huge i think i think if we if we recognize these things that clearly distinguishes and put a seat for the negotiation or the or the sourcing at the board table oh wow that's a very good valuable insight that you have given and shared with us and um, i'm for sure all the audiences would really appreciate that amit and uh, thank you very much amit for your time and i know you are running late for your next meeting but uh, i really appreciate your time uh, to come to this round table at procurement perch and we wake uh, yourself as well thank you very much for your precious time and uh, if anyone has any questions please we have around 5 minutes uh, for question and answers uh, you may uh, you may ask uh, questions if amit has 5 uh, minutes of his time he can also uh, join in or else we wake would answer that yeah alpa i'm sorry i'll have to log off but really yeah. want to thank for this Amit, opportunity it was lovely having you on the show i really enjoyed the the, the discussion we really but, uh, enjoyed and <coughs> yeah thank, thank, thank you, you so much thank, thank you have a good day thanks so far thank you amit and thank you amit so thank you very much for your time it was a really interesting conversation and uh, thank you so much vivek we really thank enjoyed thank you so much our <laughs> uh, absolutely aval and uh, no, amit great to be with you alpa thank you so much a uh, one one just last piece i would like to leave with the community I'm hey sorry, uh, i have to log off let's, once again yeah, guys please that's, so that's fine that's fine amit um stay connected all right uh, reach out uh, we are always there to help mm-hmm. i think many of us can help each other it is my observation that while we are procurement people we never talk numbers we never talk numbers i i read number of articles on linkedin i read number of articles in magazines and i never see any procurement person able to quote many numbers so please get closer to numbers please don't take a back seat there's lots we do which is not recognized and unfortunately that recognition is going to a lot of other people who are on the fringes but it appears that they are doing the work because we are so much bogged down by the paperwork and all those process activities no process is important but we in procurement we do create a lot of value i'm sure all of you know it all of you recognize it so um, my my limited sense is um, focus on numbers focus on the commodities and uh, please do interact and and move forward you know don't don't take a back seat on on everything in the organization okay so uh, alpa wonderful thank you and uh, aval for uh, inviting me to this Session. Thank you for your precious time, and it was a pleasure having you here at the round table. I'm for sure our audiences would have had uh, ample amount of knowledge from both yourself and Amit. And uh, if you, if anyone has any question, you may ask later on as well. And we will ensure that we, uh, Amit and Vivek, whatever they would guide you. we can forward it across to you all it is a great pleasure thank you audience thank you very much and this round table will be uploaded on our procurement perch website so in case you have missed out anything any part of it you can review it because it is recorded and uh, it was lovely having all of you thank you so much thank you alpha thank you so much everyone Thank you, Thank you sir. For it was it was an absolute pleasure to listen. Thank you, Alpha, as well for such a beautiful moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Bupendra. Thanks, Bupendra and Anand. Okay. See you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye for now.